we're going to transition into the technology conversation because, as you know from the description of who we are, uh, we're not only about the future of cities and urban sustainability, we're about the connected technologies that are going to drive us toward that sustainable future and equitable future for the city. So, in the spirit of all of that, we've asked a crew of folks to join us this afternoon to talk about V to X, the vehicle to X, the vehicle to the grid, the vehicle to infrastructure. And we're going to be talking about linking those vehicles that move us around to the infrastructure and leveraging the data in the smart city. And to help us do that, Boris Karsh, Vice President for Strategy at Cubic Transportation Systems in San Diego, is here to moderate the panel. Welcome, welcome to Boris and your panelists. Come on. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Gordon. Um, thank you, everybody. So we're switching tact from planning to technology. Um, so I'm very pleased to have um, my panel members here. Um, so I'd like to introduce my panel. Um, Satoshi Nakajima um, yeah, is from um, UI Evolution, a former Microsoft architect, uh, brings a lot of experience around um, software architectures, data management um, in the connected vehicle space. And I've got Arjav Trivedi, who is the co-founder of RightScout. Um, I'm oh, sorry, right cell, I should say, my apologies. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of experience in mobility management, and as Gordon introduced me, uh, Boris Karsh, Vice President of Strategy from Cubic Transportation Systems. Uh, we're very involved in payment solutions, traffic management, um, uh, to solve the problem of congestion. So perhaps to kick us off, um, I'd like to get a show of hands. Um, you know, uh, connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles is a very big topic at the moment. And my feeling is I think everybody understands the potential in the long term as a solution for urban mobility. But I just want to get a sense from the audience on, um, you know, does everybody here believe that connected and autonomous vehicle will be a very significant societal and technology change over the next 20 or 30 years. Is there any doubt here? If I can have a raise of hands, please, on who believes it's going to be a big, big change for all of us? All right, so we won't spend time on, yeah, will connected and mobile, uh, autonomous vehicles change society and deliver significant benefits, but we'll talk about what may that look like, and more importantly, what are some of the implementation challenges, how do we get there, what are some of the near-term things we can do. So with that, uh, if I could please ask each of my panel members, maybe start with um, uh, Satoshi, uh, talk very briefly about uh, what you do, what your company is involved in, and how you fit into this uh, connected and uh, autonomous vehicle space. Okay. Uh, so the, the name of the company is UI Evolution. Uh, we started uh, um, as a sort of the technology company to make it easy to deliver the user experience to a variety of devices. Uh, you can call it the IoT company, but now the most of our business is in the connected car space, which is the really growing, uh, rapidly growing. Um, the, uh, the, we actually partner with the Toyota, the sponsor of this event, uh, since uh, 2011. Uh, we provide a software for, for the head unit, where right? you see the uh, car navigation and music, uh, also the connectivity through the smartphones and also the cloud services uh, to analyze the data from the vehicle. And the, the, right now, we, see, we are still in the first phase of the connected cars, uh, mostly the infotainment, right? music, the internet music, and uh, car navigations. But the second phase is the more data coming from the cars to the cloud. Right, we are talking about the millions of cars sending the CAN data, which is the information about the brakes and uh, uh, the engines, but also the road conditions and then even the videos and photos of the environment. So massive amount of data will be collected on the cloud, and then uh, we are now applying the machine learning technology to analyze that data, to extract the useful information about drivers or cars or even the road conditions. And that's the, the very interesting um, uh, challenge and then also, also opportunity for a company like us. But this is still the second phase. The third phase is the true autonomous cars. And that's the very interesting topic. 
And I, I do believe that this is going to change the city completely, right? Just like a smartphone changed our lifestyle, right? Imagine 15 years ago, right? We just started making a phone call from the wireless phone, but now everybody's accessing the data from the smartphone only 15 years. And then this speed of innovation is happening in a car, and then car well, changes the city. I think, I think that's, that has to be the, the topic of this uh, panel. And uh, Ajay, perhaps you could give us out your perspective from RightSell's point of view. Sure. So um, RightSell is the leading platform to launch, scale, you know, integrate um, autonomous and new mobility services. So what that means is for our customers, which are car companies, you know, some of the leading ride-sharing, car-sharing companies in the world, campuses, um, some of the top technology companies here in the Valley. We help them sort of launch, scale, and then integrate across ride-sharing, car-sharing, and then fixed route and you know, sort of uh, tr traditional transit systems. And the reason this is important is because, you know, if you look at the most successful players in the mobility world, right, you know, the secret behind, say, the success of an Uber or a DD or an Ola in India is sort of this dynamic demand and supply balance. But there's something pretty uh, unique about how each of these players has been able to win. They've been able to win by creating massive artificial scale sort of, uh, of supply by you know, investing, raising billions of dollars investing it, and then creating a similar level of demand. And then they raise the supply and the demand, and they slowly pull the subsidies out, right? Um, and that's a pretty unique way of getting dynamic demand and supply because it requires investing essentially tens of millions of dollars for every city that you launch. Um, and that's not something that a city can do easily. It's certainly not something that a small campus you know, can do easily. But the thing is, this is this really unique innovation, right? You know, the thing that differentiates Uber from a traditional transit system is that an Uber can get you know, uh, 20,000 drivers at, at commute time and then sort of go down you know, to 2,000 drivers at off-peak times. Um, and there's a lot of questions around you know, ethics, labor, uh, but fundamentally, this efficiency has been extremely hard for most startups also, you know, not just cities, to, re to get. And, and the way we are approaching this problem, we are helping our customers solve this. Um, and in doing this for different units of society, from a campus to a city to a multi-city, multi-country mobility system, it allows us to um, align these players. Um, so I think one of the key challenges you know, in a, for autonomous mobility is going to be that the way this business is shaping up, it's sort of lending itself to creating um, you know, near monopolies. And you know, transportation is such a fundamental thing. It's how we get to opportunity, you know, to, to sort of food, to water. And, um, and sort of at this point, sort of the two approaches that we have seen, right, cities or countries sort of completely stamping down on new mobility services, that's not good. Uh, you know, all you need to do is sort of look at some of the cities before you know, Uber and Lyft and how hard it was to get transportation to see you know, how would the world look if, the go if government ran all transportation. The other end of the spectrum is you know, uh, what happens if Ola you know, runs all transportation in India and Didi runs all transportation in China and Uber does it here. That's not a great world either, right? So how do we get from sort of where we are today to where each one of us, including you know, the Ubers and the Lyfts and the car companies, has a stake in an autonomous future? That's sort of what I think um, it's an interesting problem. That's what we work on. Yeah, great. Thank you. And yeah, I'm really pleased to be on the panel with uh, RightCell because we, as Cubic, come really from the government side. You know, we deploy technology helping government agencies make their public transportation networks better through integrated fare collection systems. So for any of you that had the pleasure of taking the BART system or the general public transportation system here in the Bay Area, the clipper car technology is provided by Cubic, similar with international cities. Uh, the Oyster Card solution uh, in London is another example of what we're involved in. And all of our customers are really starting to think very hard, you know, how do they take advantage of what uh, private, public trans uh, private transportation networks bring to the table, how do you integrate the systems together, and you know, certainly we see that the challenge of that is going to get greater as the possibilities through automation and connected vehicles increases. So perhaps with that, you know, that's kind of where we're at today. I uh, could ask the panel members to talk about, you know, if you take this really dangerous path of a crystal ball and go out, you know, this ludicrous long distance of you know, 40, 50 years and say 2050, where will we be at? You know, what mix do you see? How will autonomous cars uh, interact with um, overall the mobility 
services that are provided in the city. And uh, perhaps while you talk about that, what do you see are some of the key challenges of getting there um, you know, to get to that utopian future, which I hope is utopian, anyhow? Yeah. So actually, the, the 2050 is easy. Uh, right? we, I, I don't need a crystal ball. I, I know because in this uh, technology sector, right, the, the innovation of technology is so rapid. So I'm so sure that the, the autonomous car will be safer and cheaper than a human-driven car. Guaranteed. That is coming. I mean, there are a lot of technical challenges we have to solve, but by 2050, absolutely sure that the, cars, or the autonomous cars are safer. And once they pass us, we never catch up, and they keep improving. So if, if you build the new city in 2050, right, if I am a mayor, I said, here's a zone, only autonomous car can drive around, no human beings. Right, that's the best way, that's the safest city. Right, so that, that's easy to define. But the, today, we have infrastructure, we have businesses, we have a lot of parking lots. Right, so how to get there is the question. But if we don't prepare, we're going to be behind. That, that's the most difficult, right? Because I was reading some of the stats of the, uh, the buildings in the United States. The typical concrete building lasts 70 to 80 years. So today, a lot of city, even I'm from Seattle, right, city requires to office spaces to have a certain number of parking lot spaces uh, right, based on the square foot of office spaces, right? That's, that's the low, but that won't be required anymore in 2050. But the buildings last 70, 80 years. So how we deal with it, right? Well, is it fair to ask them to put the parking lot today knowing we don't need it in the future? Right? That's, that's the biggest challenge I, I can think of, and, and um, this might be an interesting topic to discuss. Thank you. Um, I would mostly agree. I think 2050, I wouldn't say it's easy because I think we don't know uh, the new sets of innovations that will come. But I think if, if you're looking primarily at autonomous cars, I would agree that uh, the technology for driving, you know, self-driving itself is uh, sort of it's a no-brainer. I mean, I, I learned driving in Bombay. And disclaiming all personal responsibility, I blame Bombay for the fact that uh, I failed my driving test five times. Um, and, if, and people ask me, sort of, why did you start a transportation technology company after learning security and machine learning? Um, you know, it's because I had to wait you know, in front of my office for a bus once every, you know, that came once every hour for years. Um, so I think, I think the challenge is, um, I think the challenge is sort of, if you, in my view, from what we have seen in transportation, you know, trying to sort of do real-time ride sharing before Uber existed, and then you know, in the Uber world, and then helping sort of people uh, sort of scale mobility systems independently. The, ch the key challenge in getting government, cities, society to adopt technology is often not technology, but what it, the change that it brings to you know, the ecosystem around it. And, um, and right now, I think that there is a, a sort, of, sort of trying to get government to be like Uber doesn't work easily for a number of reasons, right, that are mostly societal, economic. Um, trying to get large companies sort of which are you know traditional sort of manufacturers of vehicles to be like Uber requires a, a big set of people inside them to succeed and I think those are likely to be the biggest challenges in going from here to that utopian autonomous world and and I don't think that there are any easy answers but the way we look at it there's a few sort of principles that if all stakeholders follow you know it, it leads to generally the right direction uh, there's transparency so you know Seattle is a great example. You know, uh, you, there are cities that uh, say, "Hey, you can run a ride-sharing system here, but we're going to put an artificial cap on how many vehicles you can have," um, and you know that didn't work in New York. There are cities that say you can have as many ride-sharing vehicles as you want, which is hard because you know when you get to 50,000 Uber vehicles, sort of you know, traffic is going to be a problem. And, and what Seattle said is, "We want open data." Right. You can run ride-sharing system here, and, and we, we're going to have you know, sort of, uh, maybe some limits, but fundamentally what we're asking for is that you open up data about how many vehicles you know, exist in what place. So I think transparency is really important, to require, especially for government, to require off of all stakeholders, open APIs that don't you know, compromise privacy. 
um, integration, right? If you look at government, you know, looking at the other side, there are transit systems that don't even integrate their own fixed route and sort of on-demand paratransit systems. You know, they just exist in silos inside of this one organization. And there's no way you can even think about competing with startups like Uber if you know, you're not sort of looking at your own business holistically, right? So integration both within organizations but also with the private, between private and public systems. And then separation of powers, and I think this is the key one. You know, I think there's a lot of value that, that you know, a car sharing system or a ride sharing system brings to the transit agency. But you look around and you see you know, transit agencies sort of handing over portions of transportation in cities to either new or old mobility companies, right? Um, and, and the problem here is that if, you, if the same people that provide transportation also decide who gets it, for how much money, where, in what format, it, you quickly get to this sort of a, a system that looks more and more like Ma Bell, right? This massive monopoly that controls too many things. And so, you know, it, it becomes important to separate out the control layer, right? The software operating system, if you will, that manages across these mobility systems from the providers themselves. So I think if that's sort of how I see us getting towards Utopia, although I have to admit I don't quite know what Utopia is. And that's, that's why it's exciting. Yeah, uh, I agree. And, you know, I will admit I'm a hopeless optimist. So, you know, I kind of see a future where, you know, these changes in technology, you know, truly help us, you know, reclaim the city space, get rid of congestion by making it easy to connect and have people move seamlessly from different modes of transportation, whether that's, you know, high capacity, uh, long distance, uh, train and bus roads that, that take care of the congestion on long distance road to easily connect people to their local destinations through all sorts of shared modes. Uh, but the key challenge to all of that is really achieving good integration between the policy setting side of it um, in terms of how do you achieve social equity, how do you subsidize services where they need to be subsidized, at the same time really enabling this fantastic innovation ecosystem in that the you know, private companies bring uh, to the mobility services. So I think we heard a couple of the challenges here, and I think a common theme is, yeah, how do we get that integration to happen? And I kind of feel there's a lot of good near-term things that can already be done today. Um, so, you know, if we go from the long-term to the near-term, um, what are some of the things that you think, you know, if we're talking about, uh, if, if the city leaders and planners in the room here that need to make decisions around what to do with this technology, how to get ready for it. What are some of those specific near-term possibilities and steps that you feel should be uh, taken? Okay, so the, the immediate, so actually the short term is, is easier too. The, the mid-term is difficult, but the short term, uh, we're gonna see a lot of data coming from the car. Right, you can think it of as um, there is artificial intelligence on the cloud which has uh, millions of eyes on the road. Right, that is the world coming in five, 10 years. Right? We're talking about that short term. And the, the cars will get a lot of information, right? of course, from the car itself, right? Right? where people hit the brakes. Right? So from that information alone, we can understand the, the road conditions, right? the weather, or how bumpy is it, or is it safe to design? Right? Why so many people hit the hard brake here? in the intersection, right? That helps the city to design or modify. Um, the another information might be uh, Amber Alert, right? Amber Alert rely on the people to look at, but now the, the, the vision system can easily detect. So not only for the kidnapping cases, but we can probably apply to more, more lower crime case, like a theft, right? If the, every car started scanning the number plate to detect any stolen car, do you get that information immediately? That's the immediate benefit we get from those. So there are a lot of um, immediate benefit we can get from those information from the millions of cars. And uh, as I said, because the Toyota is a sponsor, but Toyota is investing a billion of dollars to connect those cars to the cloud. And then they wanna use those data to provide the services to not only drivers, but insurance companies or financial industries or cities or government. Uh, so th I think there's a lot of opportunity here. What can city leaders and planners do in the near term to help push us towards an autonomous future? Um, I'll sort of go back to my principles because I find they work well. So uh, you know, transparency, right? 
require that, um, you know, have open data yourself, and I think cities are doing increasingly well, you know, from sort of release, opening up their transit data to, you know, increasingly data about safety, but, you know, require that private players using shared infrastructure have open APIs. Um, you know, you, you, there's two things sort of that, that are nuances here that sometimes get missed. The first is that, um, you know, open data doesn't mean that they open up your entire business database to you because there's massive privacy implications of that. So you have to be mindful of that. But I think saying if you run a car sharing or a ride sharing system, we want you to just let us know where the cars are, right, without necessarily knowing who is in it. Is, is very, you know, most players that we've seen are very open to it. And what it allows you to do is, is understand the impact, positive or negative, of these new systems on your city. And the second nuance is, you know, a lot of times you can get data and then you have no idea what to do with it. Um, and and it, as you open up more and more data, that becomes a challenge. And so finding the right tools so that you can start using this data is important. And there's a lot of, you know, sort of, uh, of companies, people out there who can help you with this. But, you know, uh, transparency, opening up data, and then finding the right tools to be able to visualize it, to use it. Um, integration, uh, you know, integrate your paratransit systems with your on-demand transit systems with your fixed route systems. And what that means is, you know, these departments sort of have to talk to each other, right? Integrate your transit systems. Here in the Bay Area, we have three very good transit systems, and, um, you know, a lot of people would argue that they could integrate, you know, better than they have been able to. And there's massive challenges in an area this large doing it, but it's important. Um, Integrate with the private, you know, use the open data to int tightly integrate the private and the public systems. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could get out of, uh, you know, a sh uh, your train, you know, your BART, and have a shared ride Uber waiting for you in, you know, sort of a, a, a transfer point, just like you have these special transfer points? Then you wouldn't have, uh, you know, 50 Uber drivers just milling around the BART station or the transit station. You know, you would, you would, and people would be able to have smaller transport sort of times to transfer from X to Y, which means less people waiting. And then finally, separation of powers. Um, you know, uh, by all means, you know, just like Boston is doing with the MBTA, use Uber and Lyft as integrated parts of your transit infrastructure, integrated with car sharing systems. But have software that you know, s says, here's, you know, here's how I decide where I use Uber versus Lyft versus an internal transit vehicle. Um, here's how much I'm willing to pay for it. Uh, you know, here's how I'm going to price compare between these vendors, potentially. And here's where I'm going to spend my subsidy dollars because Uber and Lyft don't find it profitable to operate in that part of town, right? And so, but, but separating that decision, right, is important. And also, to some degree, thinking about, do you want to hand over your customers to one private player, um, you know, by just saying, here, I'm outsourcing this to this one player, or do you want to keep your customer and still allow the player to serve them when it makes sense for all stakeholders? So transparency, integration, and separation of powers. Thank you. And uh, we're seeing the same with our customers being, you know, the public transportation agencies. It's really a big focus on open systems, open integration. So as procurements come up, and there's a fairly big technology shift happening at the moment, you know, uh, five years ago, people probably would have called us crazy if we said we can connect cars and buses reliably to cloud-based computer systems and take advantage of that data. But that's a reality now. So as these procurements come out, procuring for open systems for enabling integrations between these private and uh, public modes of transportation, yeah, we see as a really critical near-term step to get us on that road. And that really allows, in our view, the experimentation to happen on different models, different business models um, on that. So I kind of recognize we've got a very short session, and we can probably talk hours about this topic, but I would be it would be a shame to deprive a uh, USC audience uh, the opportunity to perhaps ask some questions. So I'd probably like to reserve the last few minutes and um, yeah, invite questions. And it looks like there's a gentleman very keen already. So please, sir. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you all. Bill Leedy, Leedy Foundation, Juneau, Alaska. I want to offer you a contrary hypothesis for your consideration based upon a grad school paper I did in 1971. The private vehicle as we know it, and that enormously inefficient system we've built to accommodate it, will be obsolete by 2050 because primarily of sea level rise. We'll have so many environmental refugees, we can't afford to perpetuate that enormously inefficient system. We'll have to build something based entirely on public transportation. And so the, the conversation about whether we're going to have battery electrics or hydrogen or self-driving vehicles is will be irrelevant by 2050. Hypothesis. Thank you. Thank you. It's, 
All right, uh, we'll take the other question. We'll see if we can answer them together. Thank you, Gordon. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm fascinated by the, the vision of, of a uh, connected future that's, that's being presented, uh, but I have a question uh, about uh, data quality and data security. Uh, I think we are assuming uh, that all of these connected systems, especially open systems, will be reliable and, and, and that we can trust the information coming from them. Uh, but last week, we saw a distributed denial of service attack uh, that relied on hacked Internet of Things connected devices. Uh, I wonder if the panelists could comment on, on how we can trust and, and have confidence in these systems in, in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to try and attempt a very quick go at question uh, number one, because I don't think we can link them and then ask our panelists to see if there's any dissenting opinion, and then I'm going to maybe hand question number two, uh, two to Satoshi and Ajay to uh, answer. So firstly, on the question of, yeah, will there still be private transportation, right, or in a significant way? Uh, and I'm going to offer a personal view here. The answer is, Probably not, but I think what will change is that the service provision of what looks kind of like really totally shared private transportation or public transportation will be provided by private operators. A good example, if you look at other parts of the world, it's not uncommon that the government takes the role of setting transportation policy, enforcing policy, you know, setting rules around what can be used, where, pricing, etc. but then uh, enables private operators to then be the service providers. So I see a future where there's a number of private service providers yeah, providing autonomous fleets, uh, providing technology systems that allow interoperability, compete with each other for efficiency of service delivery. But yeah, it is probably not unreasonable to think that yeah, the role of government in terms of forcing policy setting will probably have to become stronger, which addresses some of the governance issues, I think, Arjo. Uh, hinted to, so I'm not sure whether you want to add to that as a yeah. answer. I certainly think the role of government in setting policy will become broader, and I hope that that policy is a dynamic, it's set in a dynamic way, using you know an open configuration rather than rules that are changed once every five years, right? And I think that's necessary because otherwise we will end up with a you know having to have a fully government controlled and owned system, and. You know, it's very difficult to make that you know successful just for a number of sort of you know reasons, right? Uh, economic, societal. So, I, but but I do think that that government's role will increase, um, and hopefully it increases in a way that is sort of open, transparent, etc. Um, in, in, interesting sort of thing about sea level rising is that transportation. You know, if you look at the number one cause, some of the leading cause of it, they, they tend to be sort of the ships that move cars and goods across the seas, right? On the other end of the the scale, livestock. Uh, so, uh, you know, we may not be able to fix it. But, but, I, but I think the other part of this is, so to answer the second gentleman's question about the quality of data, I think there's two separate questions. There's the quality of the data itself, and, and no, you can't trust all of the data all of the time, but using regulations, you can require that, you know, that private providers provide you good quality data. And I would say that if you look at the data that the California DMV gets from people like Google, you know, about autonomous vehicles and how often they would take off control, it tends to be pretty good. Um, and then the, the other part of it is security. Again, you can't secure all of the systems all of the time, but again, you can have standards and, and sort of have the right you know, carrots and sticks to get people to be more secure. And I think that there's always a scare when a new technology comes out, right? There was one around cloud computing and one around mobile devices, and we, we, you know, we are all using mobile devices and we're all using cloud computing. And yes, a lot of data gets sort of compromised, but then we, the, the, the net, net net is still a positive, right? So I, I'm not too worried about that, although I think we have to be very cognizant about it. And I think from Toyota and BMW to startups, everyone is taking security more seriously. Yeah. No. And then this, this security and also so the, the privacy issue is a huge topic, and we have only one minute. But the, one of the things we are doing is really separating the, um, the private information yes. from the public information. Correct. Right? I mean, no matter what, the people will steal the data. Yes. But if the data doesn't contain the user identity, then it's just a bulk of data, right? How many cars are on this street? Yes. Then, then in, that information has no privacy. So I think we have to start architecting the database so that in case if somebody steal the data, still the privacies are protected. And there are many ways to do that, and, and this is the one of them. But um, I, I, we do understand that uh, this is a, a huge uh, topic. And we need to work hard to make sure that it's 
it's safe, but also we need to educate the public that there is a technology to protect them, and that we need to make sure that we have a good track record to keep that doing that. And I think uh, the other bit, and, yeah, we're involved in you know, traffic management, a lot of mission critical systems, and yeah, the point is correct. Yeah, keeping data 100% clean, 100% secure is hard, but I think one of the other ways to address it is through redundancy, right? And a simple example to me today is, right, if we get our Google Map guidance today on a mobile phone, right? We know we can kind of trust it, but it still doesn't absolve us to use our sensors, right, eyes, ears, uh, to look around, to check signs, to check street signs. So in the future, I think the same methodology will happen, right? Uh, cars and vehicles will have independent systems that use different sensors to validate information, whether that's information coming from a connected infrastructure, like a street, uh, a street lamp with sensors communicating to the car, whether that's sensors on the car itself. So I think part of achieving mission criticality is having lots of information redundancy so that judgments can be made at a computational level on data quality and compensate for what are natural imperfections in the system. So with that, I think our clock has run out. Appreciate the questions. I hope that was valuable to you as a panel, and uh, thank you all. Thank you for our panel. Thank you, gentlemen.